Well, I would say this was one of the more unique projects that I've ever worked on. And it came about almost accidentally mm -hmm. um, and then became something very significant art historically. Okay. And we went to visit our Latin American galleries. We stood in front of LACMA's amazing uh, Diego Rivera Flower Day painting. Mm -hmm. um, and you said to me, I think, well, you know, there, there are models, ancient yeah. models for these for those figures. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I was and I didn't know that. So all of a sudden our conversation turned to modern art. You immediately said, Oh, I studied that for Picasso. Right. That's right. I I was yeah, talking about I, I not the relationship between Rivera and ancient art, Aztec. Those were the models, and you immediately said, oh, I did that for Picasso. Right. I always find that artists are more interested in ancient art, and that modern art collectors somehow don't make that leap, that, that artists are always looking at art of the past mm -hmm. as a way forward. And you already knew that about Rivera. You had spent time thinking about it. I think it was more instinctual, because I've been looking at the at the pieces at the Museo de Antropología really intently uh -huh. and intensely. And I could, like, immediately when I saw Rivera, I was like, oh, here they are. It was, right. it was more that experience at the Museo de Antropología, looking at the collection, trying to show it in, in the best way possible that made me see Rivera and Aztec art behind him. The show is organized. Um, you start at a very early beginning when these two artists are adolescence mm -hmm. almost, yeah. uh, drawing teenagers. classical art and uh, drawing plaster casts. They're teenagers. They are teenagers. You see portraits, uh, self-portraits of each, uh, among their first important self-portraits. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah. then the exhibition moves into this room of, of, of cubism where, where I would say it's worth the price of admission just to walk into that room. Yes, it's true. To see this dialogue. And it's dialogue. really 1912 to 19, 15, 16. Right in that exact like the, moment. Uh -huh. And then you move from the cubist room to the largest room in the exhibition, <clears throat> which is where you see the paintings of the 20s and 30s uh, juxtaposed with ancient Mesoamerican and ancient classical art. And that's really the most complex room um, where you see these big statements by both artists. Mm -hmm. um, you see all the questions of what happens in the 20s and 30s. And then we see the, we, we have two rooms where, where the, the 30s, in the 30s, where the artists diverge, where Rivera is back in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, Picasso's in Paris. They're looking at ancient art in very different ways. But the two rooms are, have uncanny similarities, even though they've really mm -hmm. separated. I think the delicacy of the Rivera watercolors, gouaches of the Popol Vuh, and then uh -huh. Picasso's retelling of Aristophanes and si. classical narratives is really fantastic. I think so, too. Both works on paper, both works of not a retake on classical mythology. Exactly. No? Maya uh, and Greek. So that is great. And then we end the exhibition with, uh, in the middle with this film uh, by Rodrigo Garcia, which juxtaposes the um, Rivera's murals in San Francisco with the Guernica of Picasso mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as an abstract dialogue. Uh, it has just music. There's no words. There's no words. And you learn a lot visually about these two artists and where they went. What began as a sort of speculative idea mm -hmm. about just thinking differently about time and two artists, I myself was surprised at how much new art history was created through this project. That is amazing. We had a research and development period. We weren't 100% sure this exhibition would work at the beginning, right? And it's not like a retrospective or a period of time and you know you're just going to do the exhibition because it's worth documenting. This was a question. This was a question. <laughs> that we exactly. asked. Absolutely. And what, what was also interesting in the process is to, to really compare an, a European artist with a Latin American artist or a Mexican artist. The way Rivera started, it's so different from the way Picasso started his career. Right. I mean, he, he also talks about it. And, and I think all of the Mexicans coming into the U.S. or the ones who went to Paris like I did when I was young, we feel that, oh my God, 
this is so big for us. Who are we? Because we are born with so many different voices inside. We really need to grapple with the indigenous cultures really close to us, with, right. with what our own culture has denied and how we have not these competitive voices. And it's, we don't have one single, one single voice to, to understand the world. We really are not born like that. And you can see that in Rivera and Picasso and how, mm -hmm. he, how Rivera takes a longer time to really find his voice as an artist mm -hmm. because he recognizes the contradictions. Yeah. And I think that is beautiful and it's set there in the exhibition to compare the artist that is being considered the most important artist of the 20th century. Picasso with Diego Rivera, he's important, but he hasn't been considered that. Like the temptation is to try to find Rivera's strengths from the beginning and we just told the story as it is. Yeah. No, well, like and, that's right. how, how the search for this contradiction and his voices and how that really led yeah. him to discover himself and how that echoes and it's interesting to Picasso himself. So well, that is that is something what I at least I learned from the experience. Yeah, no, there was a lot to learn, including the fact that most people would assume that uh, Diego Rivera copied Picasso always mm -hmm. and was always a secondary character. Now it's true that Picasso was a giant in Paris and that Picasso was interested in Rivera and told his friends how great Rivera was, was very helpful to Rivera. Yes, yes. But as we found in our research, Picasso also copied Rivera. Yes. <laughs> and, and we have that very well documented in very the book. Very well documented. And he's in dialogue with Rivera. You, you can see those. I mean, they are writing each other's. They are visiting each other's ateliers. And, and you can see that Picasso actually really brought in a little bit of Rivera's careful skill yeah. at, at painter. He has, he's such a skillful painter. And Picasso is so, like this improvisation. It's beautiful. It's just amazing. You can see mm -hmm. the movement and, and almost his spirit, boom, mm -hmm. there in the painting. But through these paintings that are actually documented through Rivera, because Picasso never wrote about Rivera, it was Rivera who wrote about Picasso, but it's really accurate. He mentions the day, he mentions the painting, all of them are in that room. So the touching story is that I was talking with uh, Bernard Picasso, Picasso's grandson, and about this show, and he got very excited about it, and he said, you know, Picasso kept a painting by Rivera. And I said, I didn't know that. So oh, he God. immediately and quietly sent the picture, which we looked at, uh -huh. and just loved it because it was a bottle of anise. It's a still life in a cubist way. Totally. And maybe somehow it did represent that they sat and drank together and I think talked. It did. So it's a very touching. It is a very touching painting. Painting. And it has never been published, it has never been shown, and neither. Picasso experts or Diego Rivera experts knew of this painting. And what is beautiful is what it represents. It's because Rivera in his diary, like in his autobiography, writes about five paintings that are there. And one of them we couldn't identify, and it's exactly this. It's that painting, I know. It's a bottle of anise. So, and, and again, there's this, um, there's a sense of how close they were that I think is surprising to the general it art is. history. Mm -hmm. But the show is about many things. It is about their relationship, but it's also about each of their individual relationships to the past. That is the most important thing. And one of the things that I thought was so nice about when you suggested that we include, at the beginning of the show, the plaster casts ah, that yes. are in the UNAM, the uh -huh. university in Mexico City, that Diego drew. And of course, it makes you think that any artist who was born in the late 19th century, as they were, they all started their art career meditating on ancient art, literally drawing from plaster casts. Yes. And so bringing together the Musée Picasso's um, early works by Picasso of him studying the same Venus de Milo the <laughs> that, same Rivera, exact one. that exactly. Rivera was copying in Mexico City in his university. Yes. And you, you realize this kind of the, the, the beginning of training, that commonality of That's artists beautiful. learning to work at that time. And you can almost, of course it was at different years, but you can picture them both uh, looking at those ancient sculptures and also knowing that you start as an artist looking at ancient art. And they were between 12 and 15 years old, both. Yeah. So they were child Precocious. prodigies. 
already accepted into their respective national academies, drawing with these other big guys. <laughs> that is a pretty nice, like, you know, for a film, it would be fantastic. Uh, yes, and, and it's, um, I think, again, the commonality is, so they find themselves on the forefront of the avant-garde cubism. And we all know that World War I was so disillusioning to so many artists that somehow modernity, technology had gone awry. The world was coming apart. It was brutal, violent. But um, I can't think of two modern artists who were so much part of the avant-garde who then in the 20s and 30s were so focused on ancient art. And one of the things that I note is that we, from the beginning we knew at one point the two artists diverge, even if they're both looking at ancient art, they're looking at it for completely different reasons. Yes, and they are looking at different art, ancient arts. That's right. I think what Rivera did in, in the 1920s to say, okay, I will, I will expand the canon to the Mesoamerican canon, and he won't be using any of his classical Greek. He will really create a new classical canon for Mexico and for the continent. No, he would say, and it's true, I mean, our roots as Americans, we come from these great civilizations. They had great art. Let's study it. Let's incorporate these to our present. And, and what's so interesting about the divergence is that Rivera thinks of it in very political terms for a rethinking of a, of mm -hmm. a national... A national identity. Identity. Yes, to reunite the country exactly. after the revolution. And I joke that, you know, Picasso's so big in his own mind, he's his own country, <laughs> his own nation. <laughs> so he uses his classicism to <laughs> establish the nation of Picasso. Um, he does go through, especially in the 30s, a very tumultuous time in his own life. And I find it interesting that he seeks out the classical as a place of refuge. The fact that he goes into ancient Greek mythology, mm -hmm. the core of Western civilization, mm -hmm. and really talks about what it means. All these contradictory histories. It's about violence. It's about uh, dissolution. It's about love. It's about, it's about so many things about human condition that he portrays himself in those myths, in that moment where everybody else is looking to create overarching theories of race, mm -hmm. I think he was really resisting in a very intelligent way and he was showing what art can do with that. So I started to really mm -hmm. admire him. Yeah. Like I thought this was really brave and really keenly intelligent to do. There's that fantastic surrealist painting by Rivera, which is one of the funniest moments in the show, where yes. you placed <laughs> the San Diego uh, Rivera painting, Madrake. which is, yes, Madrake. which is the bride yeah. with the skull. <laughs> you have happiness and death, this sort of innocence and the skull, and you placed it next to the Mesoamerican skull, and of course the hands are crossed in the ancient sculpture just like just that Just like woman's. her, yes. They are sisters. <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone who's looking closely, you can't help, you but, can't help but laugh. laugh. Um, yeah. And that was a surrealist painting. It is. And it shows, it is. That, it shows that surrealism has this role. It's not just cubism, but it's surrealism perfect. has this role in twisting time. I always say that even about, a lot about surrealism is about the dislocation of time. Even film and the invention of film, mm -hmm. which allows you to go into dreams, allows you to go, it, it just fractures time. And these artists are... It's like fractions that linearity of time. That's right. No? Destroys the linearity, the, the linearity of, time. of time. And they're both doing that. Yeah, one of the things that happens is mm -hmm. that, and, and I think it's because of the works selected, um, it's not as if the ancient art are illustrations that no, the artists are using. They're, they're presented prominently in the exhibition. And there's, like, there's really a breath of life, as you're saying, within those ancient artworks. And they seem to be speaking to the modern artworks in a way that's very disruptive. <laughs> it's, See, it's strange. Neither is an illustration of the other. No. Both exist by their own right, and they communicate with each other first century, 20th century, no, fifth century, Mexico, Teotihuacan, 1930s, Mexico. Yeah. It's interesting. It you, can't, you can't also not have a little bit of a sense of 
the competitiveness both of the two artists, Picasso and Rivera, but of course the real competitiveness for me that comes out of the show is less Picasso and Rivera than these two ancient traditions because when you're in the big room and you have, you know, you have Greek and Roman and Mesoamerican sculpture and there's no clear winner. There's no clear winner. <laughs> in fact, it's, that itself is disruptive to see those together in the same room. I don't think, can't think of a museum where I've ever seen Them Mesoamerican like and classical Greece and Rome together. And you understand the beauty of both? Absolutely, and the no. life of both. The life of both, the beauty of both, the different power they exert. It's different. It I mean, one of the things I think we knew and has worked out is to try to create an exhibition that can be seen on many different levels independently or together. Because you could literally go into that exhibition and just look at Mesoamerican ancient art. You could look at just Picasso, just Rivera, yeah. some beautiful works of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, uh, we have fantastic loans from the Getty, uh, yeah. which they were so generous, so generous. to us. Uh, we have our own ancient artworks. We have the Anthropological Museum. And as you negotiated, this is the first the time first that time. works from Rivera's Museum of Ancient Mesoamerican Art have ever come yes. to the U.S.? He collected over 60,000 objects. And he collected them because he just couldn't live without them. <laughs> he loved them. But in his will, he stated, I mean, this is a very nationalistic time for Mexico, he stated yeah. that those were given to the Mexican nation and couldn't leave Mexico. Well, now that California is part of Mexico, I guess that counts, but. That, that counts, and he would be happy. <laughs> but like, the Mexican um, cultural authorities made, made really an exception for us because they thought this was a very important show for Mexico. Um, yes. So that is also very good. I think, yeah, it's, it's a, well, I guess the whole show is a, is a play between some precision and some looseness, which it, I the, think is good. It is good. No, the, the thing is that it's an experiment. It's, it's an experiment. It is an experiment. But the thing that, I think it is very good to do that. Okay, you can experiment, but here are your brackets. So you don't impose mm -hmm. over history, over facts. So the facts are just moved in a very inspiring new way, but they are still grounded. And I, I think that is very, very good. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, I'm still learning things. Me too. It's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess is a good sign see, uh, for our own exhibition. Me too. And, and I can't wait to see what people will, uh, will make of it.